All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in today. My name is Pierre-Yves. I'm currently the CTO and co-founder of Exoscale. We're a Swiss cloud hosting company. Um, I'm also an open source developer. Uh, I, I built uh, Pithos and Cyanite, which are both closure demons, one for uh, providing object storage and the other for providing uh, uh, telemetry storage. Uh, and I also participate in uh, Riemann and CollegD quite a lot. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about Mesomatic, which is a library, uh, something I don't do as often as uh, uh, full-on applications. Uh, the aim of this talk is uh, basically to, get, to discourage you from building distributed systems on your own, um, presenting uh, Mesos, and presenting a simple way to interact with it. Uh, and I promise I won't dive into the CAP theorem, because um, Every other talk uh, talks about it, and I might not be the best person to, to talk about this. We're very lucky in the community to have Cal, who's doing a very good job at presenting the, the compromise that you have to make when you're building distributed systems. That's not what, what I'll talk about. Um, I'll talk about how you get to having a distributed system, because it shouldn't be a, an end in and of itself. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to Mesos, uh, and what it provides uh, as a foundation to build uh, systems uh, that are composed of uh, moving parts. Uh, and then I'll dive into uh, Mesomatic, the library, uh, and how you build things with it. So uh, let's start with how you end up with a distributed system. Uh, because you always start with a simple product, uh, with a simple ID, uh, let's say you want to change the world by disrupting the, disrupting the job board industry. So it's a nice idea. You, you, you think you have a great product, but uh, technologically speaking, it's not uh, uh, so complicated. It probably fits into a standard uh, three-tier app which talks to a SQL database, right? Uh, it doesn't fall into what we usually call a distributed system, even though uh, it has different moving parts. So you start with uh, a very simple infrastructure. Uh, it all fits on a single machine. Uh, you have your uh, uh, Clojure app, uh, which, is an, uh, which exposes uh, an HTTP service, uh, uses embedded Jetty uh, to provide this, and talks to a SQL database, uh, let's say Postgres, for instance, right? Uh, and all goes foul for a while, and then you hit the first signs of success. Um, your single ser server doesn't uh, fit your needs anymore. Uh, you realize you have to split uh, functionality into several machines. Uh, <clears throat> and you take the, um, the simple option to uh, have a load balancer uh, that will span requests onto several machines and then have a, a replicated SQL database server because you want a bit more confidence uh, in your uh, data persistence layer. Um, you, you do realize that logging becomes a bit harder. Uh, you have to reach for a centralized logging solution. Um, and you end up with something like this, which is still fairly simple, uh, fits in just about everyone's head, uh, and lets you um, uh, move on for quite a while. Um, but as traction grows, you realize that you have to add features. Um, the first one that comes to mind is subscription emails. Um, <clears throat> and you can't do that synchronously because it would be too, uh, uh, too painful and too slow. It would increase the latency of your, uh, of your requests. Um, and architecturally speaking, it's not really sound. So you decide to split that up and do that asynchronously, um, which means that you add worker machines. Uh, you also have a queuing mechanism for these uh, requests to get uh, queued into. Uh, and that's when you start to switch from uh, calling machines by name and treating them as uh, homogeneous clusters of identical machines. Uh, there, there, is, there, be there begins to have a, a switch in your head. And I mean, the, the infrastructure is still somewhat simple, but gets a bit more uh, complicated. And then your seed money runs out, uh, even though your, uh, your product has traction. And, and that's when you try to reach for monetization techniques uh, in your product, uh, you decide to have 
a, a pay for option which gives you uh, advanced analytics, for instance. But this you have to compute from uh, different sources of data. Some comes from your logs, uh, some come from your database. Uh, everybody told you that you should be doing with Hadoop or Spark, uh, and, and you have to run these batch jobs somewhere, right? Uh, so you spin up new machines. Uh, and there's this other company that you partner with, uh, which has a very weird legacy system, but they do have interesting data that you want to exchange. Um, the only client library to interact with their system is PHP that doesn't fit uh, on your existing machines, which only have Java. Um, and it starts to get a bit complicated. And, and you start uh, to be at a point where um, <clears throat> Some various machines that, uh, you, you, that don't quite fit in your head can break and break the functionality of your system altogether. And as the product grows, uh, so does your infrastructure. Uh, you have Jenkins slaves uh, to, <clears throat> to servers your continuous integration pipeline. Uh, you had to split metrics and monitoring onto separate machines because it's, it's quite a heavy job uh, given the amount of machines that you have now. Uh, you need a control, command and control solution because you realize that uh, when you go onto <coughs> machines directly to service commands, um, you mess things up from time to time. Uh, and you realize it's also time to introduce a configuration management solution uh, in your infrastructure, uh, be it Puppet Chef or, or whatever. And <clears throat> what it comes down to is that when you look at the time that you, you spend dealing with operations in your infrastructure and, and building your product, uh, it's starting to feel like you're an ops person. So if we take a step back and, and see the, the road uh, to, to here and and what you're doing, you're ticking all the right boxes. Uh, you're, you're, you have continuous integration. Uh, you have a fairly simple product in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and, and you're doing what the industry recommends you to do. Uh, but your resource utilization on machines is very low. Uh, altogether, uh, most of your machines spend 20% uh, on CPU uh, and don't consume all their RAM. Uh, but you still have peaks that you cannot uh, completely service without degradation. Um, and you have regular contention. For instance, there are peaks on your uh, uh, web service layer, which doesn't impact all the other machines. And you also have peaks on your uh, continuous integration machines, on your batch machines when you run analytics. When you add new service or new components into your, your infrastructure, it gets pretty hard. Uh, the first thing that you have to do is make uh, allocation decisions. Which machines should this go into? Uh, uh, should, I spin up, should I spin up or buy uh, new machines? And, and it's, it doesn't logically follow that your most active Git repository should be your config management one. You should be spending most of your time uh, actually building your application. And handling failure is quite hard. Um, your, monitoring, your monitoring system, uh, hopefully it's Riemann, tells you when, when things break. Uh, that works quite well. But you're, you still have to shuffle things around, spin up new machines, uh, or move service all over the place to uh, accommodate for these failures. Um, but with, when you look at it from a service or platform point of view, it all makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> you have your product platforms, uh, your website, your API, your, your backend code. Uh, you have your data platform that provides SQL, uh, your uh, <clears throat> batch layer, and your um, full text search layer. Uh, monitoring has uh, clear and separate platforms as well, and your support infrastructure is rather limited. Um, so, so this makes sense, but what you'd, what you'd really like is a way to avoid having to make these allocation decisions uh, and have a finite state of machines uh, that, that can accommodate for uh, different uh, allocation topologies uh, when picks uh, on, on separate platforms occur, right? So you look into alternatives for this. Um, containers are a thing. Uh, they do provide isolation, uh, which means that you can run uh, separate software in isolation on machines, but you still have to do the allocation and the shuffling around by yourself. 
uh, private pass or actually public pass is an option, but it's, it, it's a sort of a sandbox and you have to fit the constraints uh, that pass give you. This might work, this might not. Uh, and then there are cluster allocators uh, such as uh, Yarn or Apache Mesos, uh, and uh, today we'll talk about uh, the latter. But uh, most of this comes down to the fact that it's not your job. Uh, you should get out of the business of shuffling uh, instances or, or uh, processes around uh, and back to mostly building your product. So let's see how Mesos can, can help with that. Uh, if we look at what Mesos advertises it does, it says that it, it abstracts CPU, memory storage, and other compute resources away from machine, may there be physical or virtual, and enable fault-tolerant and elastic distributed systems to easily be built and run effectively, which sounds nice. Um, if we look at it from an architecture point of view, uh, it has uh, three components, masters, slaves, and schedulers and frameworks, sorry. Um, and it relies on Zookeeper for coordination, uh, but that's just details. Uh, if we look at how it works uh, under the box, uh, masters are here to coordinate. Uh, slaves expose resources, and workloads, which are called frameworks, come and sit on top of it. Mesos masters, they expose an HTTP and protobuf API. Uh, a web UI as well to uh, assert the state of the, the system. Uh, and they're the main entry point for frameworks which provide uh, workloads. Um, what they mostly do is they gather and they maintain slave ability, availability and capacity information, and they present uh, frameworks with resources that may, they may or may not take up on. Take up on. Uh, they're highly available and horizontally scalable, uh, which is uh, necessary. Um, Mesoslave, um, they're used to launch uh, actual uh, payloads or workloads. Uh, tasks in Mesos are isolated by way of uh, uh, namespaces or Docker. Uh, and they expose their resources to masters and resources, maybe CPU, RAM, IPs, uh, volumes, available ports, uh, and or arbitrary attributes, which are key value pairs or labels, which, which can be um, arbitrary tags. <clears throat> On top of this uh, sit Mesos frameworks, um, which is software which just instruments a workload uh, on a cluster. Uh, it's, it's composed of two components, uh, schedulers and executors. Schedulers, they interact, uh, they come and talk to the um, uh, Mesos master, uh, they receive offers from the uh, Mesos masters, and then they, um, they receive also task statuses. Uh, they, they may launch tasks by picking up on uh, provided offers, and they're responsible for exposing services uh, if you need services to be exposed. And then you have Mesos executors, which are responsible for managing uh, workloads on Mesos slaves. Uh, they report the, the status of their tasks back, back to masters, which will then uh, hand off that information to schedulers. Uh, and they're optional. Uh, Mesos slaves are able to launch uh, namespaced commands or Docker containers directly. Right. Uh, just a quick, <coughs> a quick word about namespaced commands. Uh, when I talk about this, I refer to the C groups functionality in Linux. Uh, which is a way to isolate processes. You can think of it as a much more powerful uh, cheroot. Uh, <clears throat> it's the basis on which LXC has been built, and then it's also the basis on which uh, Docker has been built. And again, that's the, the overall uh, architecture picture uh, where uh, scheduler come and talk to uh, masters. They deploy executors onto slaves, which themselves will start tasks. Let's come back a bit on the uh, offer-based allocation model that uh, Mesos uh, provides. Um, a scheduler will receive a list of offers, uh, which say I have this and that amount of RAM, CPU, uh, available ports, or this and that, uh, and decides on which it wants to pick up and launch tasks on. Um, 
this puts a lot of responsibility on the scheduler because it means that you have to, to be the one making the, the decision of I'll start my workload uh, there or there. Uh, the, the resource offers that you get are uh, decided by Mesos itself. Uh, the, algor the algorithms that um, uh, Mesos um, chooses which uh, scheduler to offer resources to uh, is pluggable, but quite effective uh, by default. Mesos tasks, uh, again, just namespaced comments, uh, isolated, or, uh, and, and they, they do express their needs in terms of capacity. So uh, a Mesos task that should be run says, I will consume uh, at most that amount of RAM and at most that amount of CPU. I also need this and that um, available uh, TCP ports, for instance. And there are, uh, again, optional uh, things that uh, a Mesos task can request. Uh, it can provide a health check uh, to assert the fact that it's correctly running. It may ask for port forwards to be done. Uh, and also, <clears throat> and this makes Mesos an interesting project, it may ask for persistent storage volumes. Uh, and, and it's one of the rare projects that tackles the uh, uh, complex uh, persistence story when you're dealing with uh, clusters. If we look at uh, some of the frameworks that, that have been built uh, and work on Mesos, uh, Apache, Aurora, and Marathon are both uh, frameworks that could be seen as uh, a private pass type of um, um, <clears throat> project. They allow you to uh, spin up uh, Docker containers or, or commands uh, and quickly uh, scale them to uh, uh, additional capacity or additional containers, uh, span several slaves, uh, and they're uh, quite effective in that regard. Kronos uh, is a bit of a distributed cron of sorts. It allows you to schedule tasks to be run. Um, <clears throat> Jenkins has a plugin that can be uh, run on top of Mesos. Uh, Hadoop, Apache Kafka, and Cassandra also are available as uh, Mesos frameworks. What I'll talk about now is uh, how you build an actual framework and how Mesomatic uh, can help in doing that. Um, Mesomatic is a, a couple of artifacts, um, a plain library, which is a facet on top of Mesos, and there's a, an optional uh, core async uh, facet for, um, for it as well. Why your library? Well, first things is uh, uh, it's a closure uh, it's a closure project. So libraries first. Um, <clears throat> existing frameworks might not exactly need you, uh, meet your constraints, uh, and if you're building any type of as a service product, uh, Mesos is a great foundation for that, uh, and having the ability to uh, <clears throat> to service uh, spin up and down workloads from your application is something that you might be interested in. Uh, and this is, was actually our need and why we uh, got into um, uh, building Mesomatic. Uh, I, also, I also think that many frameworks, uh, even though they want to embed uh, functionality within the application, will have a common set of needs, uh, and Mesomatic tries to accommodate for that as well. So if we look at the components that Mesomatic provides, uh, the first thing is uh, idiomatic closure types for the, um, the data structure that uh, Mesos exposes, uh, a facet for creating executors, a facet for creating schedulers, uh, a coercing version of uh, these facets, and a, an allocation helper uh, to help you make these allocation decisions um, because that's something that's pretty common as a need. For the type conversion, it all sits in a single uh, namespace. Uh, it's basically only three functions. There are uh, records for every, uh, for the, which are equivalents of every Mesos protobuf types. Uh, and you can use protobuf to data uh, to protobuf or data to protobuf to um, uh, convert from one or the other. Um, <clears throat> converting from uh, protobuf data is uh, really simple. You, uh, you use um, um, protobuf2 data. Um, and then you either can work with plain maps uh, using the2 protobuf uh, function, and you'll have to give a hint 
as to what uh, structure you want to convert to, or if you're coming from a record uh, data to protobuf will be sufficient. Both the executor and scheduler facades are protocol based. Um, <clears throat> your client code will have to reify a protocol to input message, so basically to receive callbacks. Uh, and it will be able to perform side effects uh, through a driver, uh, which is also implemented as a protocol. Uh, this is what the executor uh, facade looks like. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the most important uh, functions. If we look at input, uh, launch task uh, means that you were in instructed uh, to start the task. And framework message means that um, you received a, f a message from your scheduler uh, containing uh, arbitrary data. As far as what you're able to do, uh, interacting with messages, as an executor, you're able to send messages. Uh, let's say you were building something like a crawler, uh, the output of the, the crawl, that would be a task you would probably send back to the scheduler for persistence, for instance. And you're also able to send status updates for the tasks that you're currently running. And there, you're a bit more limited into the, um, uh, with regard to the payload that you're able to send. Uh, the scheduler facade is a bit uh, more involved. Uh, again, this is what the input looks like. That these are the types of messages that you'll be able to uh, uh, receive. Uh, and this is the um, functions that you can call when interacting with the framework. As far as, our, as input is concerned, the most important ones are uh, resource offers. That's a message, a message that you receive when uh, there are new resources available. When you receive this, you receive the full topology of resources. Uh, offer rescinded means that there is an offer that was taken back, probably used by uh, another scheduler. Uh, framework message uh, is when your executor sent you something, and status update is just uh, a status update for tasks that you ask to be run. The, most important, the, the two most important functions when you're dealing with workloads are uh, launch tasks and kill task. Uh, launch task picks up on an offer and says, please run this. Uh, reconcile task is used when you're building high, highly available uh, frameworks. Uh, it allows you to get back a full list of statuses uh, when you start over. Uh, and when you need more resources, you can also ask the uh, Mesos cluster to give you more if, if it's available. So what it comes down to is for most of, uh, of, of workload generations is you, re you receive offers, you launch tasks. If we look at what uh, an offer looks like, that's what you'll receive uh, when you're using Mesomatic. Um, offers will come from a host name, uh, the, the actual host name that the, the Mesos slave uh, process runs on. Uh, it will have a list of, uh, of maps, a vector of maps which represent um, available resources and may have arbitrary attributes. In that case, there are none. A task for a namespace command um, has a name and an ID that should be unique, um, a list of resources that it will consume, and the associated uh, command that it wants to run. If, you, if you'd rather start uh, Docker containers, uh, that's how it's going to look. Uh, it's, it's quite similar. You also expose the, the resources that you will consume. You may ask for port mappings, and you just uh, describe the Docker image that you want to, to run. As far as uh, the core async facets are um, uh, concerned, it's an opt-in dependency. Again, it's a separate artifact. Uh, and all it does uh, is produce all incoming messages from uh, uh, Mesos onto a channel uh, that you can consume. Uh, each, each and every message uh, uh, will come on a map, and the map will have a type key which describes the type of uh, uh, message that comes from, uh, from Mesos, which means that a very bare bones uh, scheduler could look like this. Um, you, you'll be consuming 
all messages. Uh, I'm using the reduce um, function in, um, in core async and dispatching to handle message, message uh, on, the, on the channel. Uh, handle message message can just then uh, dispatch on the type key and uh, you'll be able to uh, quickly add support for any type of message that you're interested in dealing with. And that's really all it comes down to. Uh, the last part that's exposed by Mesomatic is the allocation helper. Um, it's, it's also protocol based if you wish to plug your own allocation method. Um, it, and it's a simple, uh, it's purely functional in the sense that it doesn't actually perform anything on Mesos. It just gives you uh, a tentative topology uh, for the uh, tasks that you want to run. There's a single one for now that's um, a pure closure with, oops, sorry, with no um, added dependency. Uh, it does account for um, a number of instances that you want to uh, spin up of a single task and collocation factors, which when you want to say, for instance, which is um, <clears throat> quite popular, uh, that you may want six processes to run but only have a maximum of two on a single slave if you want to uh, account for failures. And this is expressed as two additional fields on the task description, a max collocation uh, key and a count key for the, the process. And that's all the library provides. <clears throat> what I'll spend some time now is, is looking at how you can um, easily build with a, a small amount of code um, frameworks on top of Mesos with Mesomatic. Um, let's say we want to build um, something to run our regular batch jobs. Uh, we want something a bit like cron, but that um, accounts for failures, so which will uh, launch tasks on arbitrary machines, right? Uh, you have two jobs, uh, and you decided that you wanted a static configuration in Plodger. Uh, the first one is your analytics job. Uh, it should run every 20 minutes. Uh, the second one is your usage metering job because you're um, uh, doing a, some, some sort of a, as a service uh, type product and should run every 30 minutes. Um, both consume half a CPU core and requests uh, 512 megs of RAM. The state that you'll need uh, for this, um, for this run to run is just the, dri the Mesos driver uh, to interact with, uh, launch uh, tasks on, and knowing which, which tasks are currently running so that you, you, you do not um, launch concurrent processes. For instance, if, you're, uh, if your metering job takes longer than 30 minutes, you'll decide to skip uh, an iteration. For ticking, we rely on uh, cronj, uh, which is, uh, does a very good job at uh, pro providing a facade for a, a JVM scheduler. Um, and we'll send a message on every tick uh, on, a ch on the same channel that uh, Mesos sends uh, messages on. Um, cronj accepts a simple map uh, for configuration. And we'll start with the same structure that I displayed. Uh, will input, uh, we'll input every message on the, the same channel, uh, and then we'll dispatch with a handle message uh, function. And that's what you end up with. The ticker uh, produces payloads on the channel, Mesos produces payloads on the channel, uh, and then the channel also interacts with, uh, with Mesos by way of handle message. To handle resource offers, you can associate uh, the offers that you got directly on your uh, state uh, that's uh, being uh, regularly updated in the reduce function uh, to handle ticks uh, that are sent by the ticker. Uh, you'll look if you have a job that's currently running. Uh, if not, you can use the allocate function that's provided by Mesomatic to, allo to find a suitable host to run your task on and then just launch the task, and that's it. As far as updating status information is concerned, uh, when, you, when you launch a task, you'll get 
a task running uh, message batch from Mesos, and you can update the, uh, your set of running tasks accordingly. Uh, again, when the, the task will have terminated, you'll, you'll get another message, and you can update the state accordingly. And that's, that's just about it to build a distributed cron. What I wanted to display here is that by having a very small amount of code, you, you can start and do useful things. I'll show how we can go a bit further than this, um, because this is rather simple, and this could have been done in a lower level language. Clojure gives us the, the nice expressivity uh, and the nice properties that we're interested in, but this could have still have been done in uh, something like C++ quite simply. Um, the library first approach is something that uh, I think was really interesting, as I was uh, telling earlier. And, and we have plenty of facilities to help us make better decisions when the frameworks or workloads that we want to run are a bit more complex. Um, let's say that we want to ensure that a specific topology exists uh, on our cluster, uh, which is exactly where you want to be to avoid having to uh, shuffle tasks around when they fail. Um, if, if we look at these uh, three simple things that are exposed by Clojure, um, the fact that atoms are observable, uh, the, uh, having Clojure data diff, and Clojure core match, uh, we can build a very simple system to ensure this. Um, let's say that we have our configuration that's stored in an, at, in an atom. Um, we have an arbitrary watch uh, namespace that watches over configs, maybe on the file system, and updates your configuration atom. Uh, what we can do is add a watch on that atom uh, for every change, um, and it will um, forward to a function of um, the, the reference, the old state and the new state. A simple implementation of that function uh, could just um, be a closure over, uh, a closure over the, uh, the input channel, uh, call a decision a function on the old and new state, um, which will decide any side effect that should be produced uh, and then perform these side effects. Decisions. Uh, for decisions, we can easily leverage uh, Clojure Data Diff, um, which will give you what was, what was in a map before, what was in after, and uh, uh, what changed. Um, here, I'm just looking at keys that changed, and then um, forwarding that to a changed map function for every key. And this is the, the, last, uh, the last bit uh, changed map for uh, when given in an old uh, and new and new key will uh, assert the runtime and status uh, of both the the old and new units uh, and try and make uh, an informed decision uh, and this is where what I wanted to display uh, with the simple libraries that Clojure exposes you're able to lay out your decision process in a very simple manner. Um, here, uh, if, if, the, if the status changes from uh, stop to start, uh, the side effect that I'm producing will just be to uh, um, start a new task. Uh, and one of the, the most complex, in a sense, one is when a, a runtime change, when you change from a, an isolated namespace comment to a Docker container, uh, I'll just produce two side effects the fact that I want to stop the old one and start the new one. <clears throat> and by, um, by watching uh, the, by maintaining uh, the, um, the status state that Mesos provides you with your expected topology in an atom and, and constantly uh, checking this over in your reduce function over a channel, you're, you're able to assert that your wanted topology is always produced, or at least you're always trying to converge to your expected topology in your infrastructure. And that's what it looks like. Uh, uh, you end up having, probably exposing an HTTP API to um, have simple clients know the state of the system, watching over file system changes uh, to um, produce 
an Atom configuration, run that through your decision process, uh, and then produce side effects on a channel which will interact with Mesos, which uh, itself will give you back uh, if, you're, uh, if you convert to the correct topology or not. So to wrap things up, uh, Clojure does help uh, dealing with the infrastructure in that case. Um, core async channel, they help model the flow of events uh, in an infrastructure very well. Uh, immutability uh, is nice because if you look at the actual structure uh, that was built here, the only mutable uh, piece of data that you have is your configuration. Uh, and I think that core match, even if I didn't uh, use uh, advanced techniques here, is very helps a lot making clear decisions and, and laying out the decision process quite well. Most of this is actually taken from a project that's available. It's a bit more complex than what I showed. Uh, it's called Bundes. It's a work in progress, but there is a documentation, a documentation site uh, in there uh, if you want to dig into how it's built. Uh, as far as our um, uh, feedback is concerned, uh, Mesos did help uh, move towards not dealing as much with uh, uh, the allocation process. Um, it's, it's easy to ensure that you're always having the topology that you expect on your infrastructure. Uh, co containers, if you're dealing with something that's uh, your product only, they, they ensure good enough is isolation that uh, you can rely on them. Uh, and as far as the ops burden is concerned, it's still uh, reduced because you're dealing with homoge homogeneous machines uh, which simplifies your configuration management, and then most of the workload definition happens on a higher level and is simplified. As far as future things that uh, um, I'm interested in pushing in Mesomatic, um, a bigger contributor list would be very nice. Uh, I'll, I'll keep following Mesos releases closely because it's a, a moving target which moves quite fast, uh, especially these, uh, uh, these times. Um, Example frameworks would be very uh, great if people want to jump in and, and, and provide those. Um, a, a pure JVM Mesos client would be nice because it still relies on an actual C++ library to interact with Mesos, um, which can be a bit of a burden. And then the, the project uh, that was talking about Bundes uh, should be a bit more polished. Uh, before I uh, head over to uh, questions, if there are any, I'll just say that if you're building Clojure applications, I really encourage you to look into Unilog, which is a nice wrapper around the uh, logback uh, that I built and has been uh, doing us quite, um, quite a lot of good. And that's it for me. Thank you.